The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the third chapter. <laughs> then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the waters. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. So let me emphasize again what a privilege it is to be here today. And I just want to give you a couple of highlights from the scripture passages to reflect on as we hear uh, Pat Koss speak this morning. And, um, and I'll introduce him a little bit more in just a second. But looking at Jesus' baptism, the question that surfaces for us is why was Jesus baptized? I mean, do, are we not baptized for the forgiveness of sins and Jesus hadn't committed sin? Jesus' answer is simply to fulfill all righteousness. And I think what God is saying to us is that righteousness is about the relationship that we share with God. All people, all people, not just you and me, but all people were created in God's image. And God said it was good. And by Jesus going into the baptismal waters, he is affirming that relationship. That it's about what God has done for us and not simply what we have done. We are loved unconditionally, not by what we do, but because God created us. And then I want to take you back to the, to the first lesson. And what it says in the midst of that is that a bruised reed God will not break, and a smoldering wick God will not snuff out. Think about our lives. When do we feel like a bruised reed? When do we feel like a dimly burning wick, like the light within us is about to go out? Maybe it's because of the reality of um, a death in the family, the loss of a job. Maybe it's because of illness. Maybe we're we estranged from a loved one in our life. And God says, a bruised reed I will not break, and a smoldering wick I will not snuff out. One of my favorite images of my time here at St. Paul is Pat Koss coming up to communion with his two little children, Carter and Isabel. Here was this single dad walking up, carrying little Carter. Some of you might remember that, and Isabel right by his side, receiving the blessing and then proclaiming, Next time I saw Platt, I didn't recognize him. I was serving as the interim at Hope Lutheran Church, and I extended my hand to people that were coming to a 12-step meeting, and I said, greetings, I'm Pastor Franzenberg. And Pat looks at me, and he said, you know me. Now, many times I know you when you're in the right context, but that isn't where I knew Pat from before. And he said, I'm Pat Koss. Well, then I knew. I knew who he was. And we immediately connected. And Pat shared with me that he was coming to the 12-step program because he was, in the, he was recovering in the midst of addictions. And I know, I know from my ministry here that that affects all of us. And I know particularly it affects people in Anamosa because uh, you, have the, you have been given the title, at least from Cedar Rapids Police Department, of the meth capital of Iowa. And when I was in Centerville, we thought Centerville was the meth capital of Iowa. So what that tells us is it doesn't matter where we live or who we are, it can touch all of our lives. And so I've had the opportunity this past year, my husband Bill and I have, 
to work with people who have experienced the reality of incarceration and then are coming back into the community to put their lives together. And Pat is one of those people, and I'll let him share his story. But what it tells me, I want to just add this line here. Go to the end of that first lesson, and God says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. In the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the brokenness, God says, I have called you, and I will take a hold of your hand. I will keep you, and I will make you a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind. Who is it that we don't see? Is it the homeless person on the street? Did you know that there are homeless people even in Anamosa? Have you seen them? Are, are, are our eyes blind? God said, I will open them and I will, you will be um, called. I will make a covenant with you to free the captives from prison, to release the dungeon, those who sit in darkness. And I think that the way that God transforms our suffering is by calling us to be a light to those who sit in darkness. And so um, I invite you to hear Pat's story and a bit how he has become the light in the midst of the darkness. Pat, there's um, a few more people here than one. So, so give me a second. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm an electrician. I have two beautiful My daughter's 11. They're my world. They're everything. I've been through a lot. Um, one thing, probably looking at me, you wouldn't think addiction or anything like that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see that. But... Almost 18 months ago, I was, I was a person. Didn't have a place to stay. Didn't have anybody. In the depths of addiction. So horrible that there was nothing I could do. I hated my life. Myself. I hated who I was. Everything about me. I hated the fact that I had to rely on that I didn't have any I was on the verge of losing my kids homeless that a homeless job, nothing I ended up actually going to jail and I'll reach out on that but um, growing up I was involved with religion you know? I always believed in God Hell, I lost my brother. I lost my brother in 2008. You may know him, Stephen Cost. He was my world. He was everything to me. And he was my friend when I had nobody to talk to. Always there. A smile and a hug. So when I lost that, I had a voice. And I didn't know what to do. I was mad. I was mad at God. Why did you do this? Why did you take someone away that mattered to me? And I was, looking back at it now, I was being selfish. I didn't think about him. I didn't think about him. I didn't think about anything else. So I was mad, and I turned my back away from God. But I didn't fully turn my back away. And that's where my addiction started, after my brother. I was using anything and everything to fill that void. And then I met my ex-wife and thought, well, maybe there's a reason. Maybe there's a reason. And 
was blessed with two children. And then my ex-wife left. And I thought again, why did God do this? So I just figured I can, I can run my life a lot better. It can help me. So I did. I turned my back away from him completely. And since then, I said I was homeless. I ended up going in and out of jail in Jones County for quite a few times. Went to, ended up going to Lane County for 30 days. And you know how I, everybody always says that they you all have friends. To really find out who your friends are when you're in jail, when you're homeless. Because not one person, not one person came to see me. And then I truly realized that I, was, I hated it. Because that was the one thing I didn't want. And, but I did find something. I found God again. Because I was broken. I was completely destroyed. And I had nowhere else to turn. So getting out of jail, I had two choices. I could go back to the way I was living and lose my kids. Or I could try something different. Trying to try to find a new way to live. And I turned to God. Since then, I have my kids back. I have an amazing job, house, a vehicle that sometimes works, still works. <laughs> um, I have friends now. I have true friends. And that's through this program, this 12-step program that Kat, Pastor Catherine was talking about. It's uh, Narcotics Anonymous. And coming into those rooms, God, I was lost. Lost, but God had shown me a way. And I learned that way. There's 12 steps. The first three are the easiest ones. Well, they're the easiest and the hardest. One, admitting my life is empty. That I am. Two, believing in a higher, in a power greater. And that's obviously God. Three, turning my will and my life forward to God. That was, to start off, it was kind of difficult. But, because I have a lot of trust issues, so I gave him a little bit of rope, and he hasn't let me down yet. But the people in these rooms, they're, like I said, they're true friends. They'd do anything for you. And I know that personally, with being homeless and everything like that, even when I got out of jail, I had one reach out to me, never met me a day in his life, offered me to, or offered a room, say. There's God right there. That's what we call a God shot in NA. <laughs> um, but one thing that I do I make sure on a regular basis to do is I stay very close to God. Every morning I pray. I pray before I go to bed. But it's a real simple prayer for me. It's God, take my will in my life and guide me through this day. And see, with self will, God has a funny way of doing it. You know, He'll. He'll give it back to you anytime you want. And that was, that's one thing that I, I do occasionally. I take it back. 
thinking, oh, I can do this a little better. But at the start of the day, within six hours, taking my will back, my life just was crap. Handbag, real quick. So I need to constantly remind, remind myself of that, that God will, is there and God can control my life better than I can. You know, one thing on when I was in jail, um, I met with a priest. And he was talking to me about turning my way back towards God. And that God walks a straight line. No matter how far we venture away from this line, we can always go back. All I have to do is just stop what we're doing. And... He's just, he's been there constantly, constantly through my life. Even when I didn't think he was there, he was. When, and looking back on it now, my brother, he took away the pain from him, made him stop hurting. With my kids, I still get to see him. I'm not completely out of their life. Yeah, it's not the best, or it's not everything that I want. I'd love to have them all the time, but I can't do that because they still have their mom. You know, one thing I always say now is I don't have everything I want, but I have everything I need. And to be honest, that's not even true. I have everything I want. I have everything I need. I have it through God. God has given me that, and God has shown me the way to live, a new way to live. I can, he's done this so I can relay the message, so I can share my hope. Thanks. To anybody, anybody in, the, in here, anybody in Cedar Rapids, anybody around, if I can help one person, so they don't have to follow through the steps that I walked. They don't have to feel the pain that I felt. I'm going to do that. And the fact that I have the opportunity to do that, and it makes everything, all the pain and all the heartache that I went through, worth it. Just knowing that I'm able to help one more person. So... If there's anybody, anybody that you know that's in the depths of addiction, give them my number. And I'll be in the back after with these pamphlets, uh, Narcotics Anonymous pamphlet. And they got the, the meeting list and everything. I will put my name, on, my name and number on the back. And I will always answer my phone. I will always be there. Because I remember what it's like to feel like there's nobody there. I remember what it's like to feel alone. And, but the thing is today, even when I'm sitting in my house alone by myself, I'm not truly alone. Because God's there. I talk with them, I work through my steps, and I'm happy, I'm at peace. And that's something I never found before, never found peace. Constantly looking. Now that I have God, I have peace, and I am truly happy. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much.